about 3D static modeling, tips and tricks for review and QC geological model, and will be delivered by Mr. Ari Krishna Lopulisa. He is a geoscientist with 15 years of industry experiences focusing on the development and exploitation phase, exposed extensively to reservoir geology and geophysics with significant significant strength in static geological model building. Experience in multinational companies in Southeast Asia region, Indonesia, and Malaysia. He is currently working as main geologist in charge of Rockfall Dynamic GNG business in SE Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, and Australia. He is responsible for the business development of geology designer software, which include GNG workflow consulting, evaluation project, software training, and technical sharing. He has specialty in 3D geological modeling, development and production geology, reservoir characterization, and sequence stratigraphy. Uh, now, without the further ado, uh, I will give the time over to Mr. Ari. Uh, Mr. Ari, place and time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Christian. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, let me share my screen now. Okay, good. So um, I would like to thank um, SPE Balikpapan for this uh, very nice opportunity to invite me as one of the guest speaker. Um, for today's topic, I will present um, 3D static modeling, um, the tips and tricks to review and performing a quality check of a static uh, geological model. So let me start with um, a little bit of the outline. I will start with some introduction of my background and why we are here and some of the main challenges that we are facing in the industry, right? Okay, so let me go back. One of the main challenges that we are facing in the industry. Um, and then after that, I will continue with the workflow. The main workflow, what we are doing in, what we have to do to perform a um, quality check um, 3D static model. Then we also bring this topic um, whether artificial intelligence and automation can actually be utilized uh, for this particular task, right? And uh, at the end of the presentation, I will do a little bit of conclusion and we can continue with the question and answer session. So as um, Christian already um, briefly explained just now, so yes, uh, my name is Ari Krishna. Uh, I'm a senior geologist working for Rockflow Dynamics. I have a, about 15 years of experience in Southeast Asia. So these are um, my previous companies. So currently I'm working with Rockflow Dynamics. Uh, I started my career in 2005 with Slumber J and then I moved to an operator um, with Citic. And in 2012, I moved to Kuala Lumpur working for Petronas. So I was there for five years. And now I'm with Rockflow Dynamics, um, working as a senior geologist and geomodeler. If you're not familiar with Rockflow Dynamics, maybe you're more familiar with our product, which is called T-Navigator. So that's what uh, our um, product have, right? And in terms of uh, background, um, my, my undergrad is uh, geology and my master is also uh, petroleum geoscience. So that's a little bit of my background. Um, so from the audience itself, uh, just for me and um, to have an understanding, if you can share um, what is your experience or exposure with static modeling, um, you can just type it on the chat box here, whether you have experience building a static model yourself, type it A, or if you have experience on providing inputs for static model, for instance, you are a geophysicist, sorry. So for instance, if you are a geophysicist, then you provide input, or if you are a petrophysicist, you provide input. Or if you are a reservoir engineer, then you use the static model as an, the output from static model, right, for your simulation. Or maybe you don't have experience at all with static model, which is fine. This is just for me to have an idea. Just type it on the chat box and then um, I, can, I can check later. So I will start with this very interesting quote saying that Essentially, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. This might sound a little bit harsh, right? Um, saying all models are wrong. And this quote was actually um, introduced by this famous statistician, George Box, 
from the US back in 1987 saying that all the models are wrong, but some are useful. What does it mean actually? So what it means is um, model, as we know, is always an approximation, right? It will never be 100% of what reality is, right? However, even though it's not 100% correct, but it can be useful because it's an approximation of what reality is. So it depends on the objective, depends on how we build the model and everything, depends on the input data that we are using. And then the models can be useful for, for instance, prediction, right? So that's the main idea. But of course, if you want to present to your manager or you present to your shareholders, your partners, of course, you don't want to start with this statement saying, okay, sir, this is my model, but bear in mind, my model is wrong. Of course, you don't want to do that. But you want to highlight that your models consist of uncertainties, right? That you want to mitigate and then you want to minimize the risk. That's what, what we um, have to go with that, with that direction, right? All right, so in a ENP life cycle, um, not all of us are exposed um, to static modeling or reservoir modeling simulation, right? Hence the uh, earlier question that I asked in, the, in the, one of the early slides there. Because um, uh, ENP life cycle um, in the upstream business is quite a long cycle, right? If you see here, you start all the way from the very early exploration, right? with zero wells, and then you have some exploration well, delineation, right? Then you have discovery, and then you go for an FDP, right? For field construction and everything. And then later you go to the production stages. Typically, um, reservoir modeling, in this case, static and dynamic, um, started around these stages, right? So it will start when the FDP um, start, right? So you have to build a static model to be able to have your FDP approved. And then um, the, green, the green circle here is my static model and my red circle here is my dynamic model or simulation. So there is a gap here where you already start production and then you maybe you want to history match some of the wells. So you will always need your static model for the input for your simulation. So this is where um, reservoir modeling comes in handy because um, all the necessary decision, huge investment that the, the, the operators or the government need to make is based on how accurate your reservoir modeling is, right? So the output obtained from the simulation will be used for um, predict the performance of the production of that field, right? So it's very critical. And if, as you can see here, there are a lot of multidiscipline involved, geologists, geophysicists, reservoir engineers, drillers, and production engineers. Since um, static model is one of the key element in terms of reservoir management, right? So it's very critical to, to QC, right? You have to make sure you perform a very thorough quality check on your static model before you even go to the next phase, right? Before you even go feed it into simulation because you don't want to waste time and productivity starting with the wrong model, right? So it's very important to QC the model, right? As a user, well, there are different scenarios. It's either you have the opportunity to build the model from scratch, right? For your FDP maybe, um, or you inherit the existing model from your previous colleague, right? So someone uh, before in the company heard already made the static model and they pass the static model to you. So that's another scenarios. Or maybe the third one is you have to update or rebuild the existing model because of maybe new well data coming in, right? And there is a depth mismatch, so you have to update. Or maybe you need to rebuild because you're already in a different stage of the production. Maybe you want to do EOR, right? So those are different scenarios why performing a QC in a static model is very um, critical. The next one is if you are the reviewer, right? So let's say you are the team leader of the company or you are the manager, the subsurface manager. Um, you need to QC the static model of your geomodeler before you pass it over to the reservoir engineering department team, right? 
And of course, internally, normally they already have some internal experts and it have to be a team decision to have the static model approved, right? So it involves multi-disciplines, geophysics, geology, petrophysics, uh, drilling and reservoir engineer to come up with the final static model. And if you are an external, external parties, right? So for instance, you are a partner, uh, your partner, the partner here is not necessarily the operator, but they have the right to access the model because they have the right to review and make decision based on based on the model. And of course, these partners um, usually also have the technical expert, right? And they will make business decision based on the model that you provide. Um, maybe one of the challenges here for partner is they wouldn't have access to all the data compared to the internal parties, right? Maybe they will only have the report or the PowerPoint uh, files, or maybe the grid, the 3D grid files from the modeler, but not the entire project. So that's our, one of the challenges that a partner may, might facing. The other, the last one maybe is the regulator or, or the government. Uh, for instance, in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, the, 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 the contract is PSC. Of course, the government have the final say whether the static model will be approved or not, right? Because it's gonna be a major milestone in order to proceed um, to the next stages, right? So these are all uh, the main stakeholders, right? Um, in order to QC and to approve um, the static model before going to the next next stage. But of course, there are some challenges. Um, the challenges that I want to highlight here is a typical challenge that um, um, oil and gas companies are facing, right? So earth model comprise of information from various disciplines, right? So this is an example where you have seismic data together with your well data, dynamic properties, static properties, Okay, sorry, dynamic properties, static properties, right? A lot of information are taken into account in building a static model. And sometimes if there are a lot of transfer of the project within the company, within the organization or to outside, there will be always a missing data or missing information. So that's the challenge. And probably there is no proper handover between, sorry, I go back, no proper handover between the team members, right? And there are maybe a lot of versions of update of the model. You can see one project maybe consists of model one, model two, model three, until model 10, right? So it needs to have a proper QC. And the other challenges it will be maybe it's, will, it's built on different software and you're gonna review it on another software. That's another challenge. And it's too complicated to replicate or update because a lot of manual adjustment was done in the model. So these are the typical challenge that the industries are facing. So for this particular webinar, um, um, it's since we only have one hour, I will focus mainly on the QC, how to do QC. I will not emphasize on how to build the model itself because that's gonna take a lot of information and I don't think we have enough time. But on this particular um, um, time, let me, sorry, yeah, let's keep on moving without, Check the transition. Okay, let me go back. Right, so for this particular um, presentation, I will focus on how to QC in a structured manner, right? Um, because sometimes we go directly focus on the model, right? On the model when we're QC but we forget that the input data is as important or maybe more important than the model itself. Because once the data input data is wrong, then the model will be wrong as well. Garbage, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So I would uh, like to show you some, some guidelines here of how to do a structured kind of QC with regards to a static model, right? So we'll start with level one. I just call this myself level one. So we start with the very basic uh, QC, uh, the general QC, the input data QC, and then the second level, which is the model itself, the structural QC and the property, which is the, the, the phases and the porosity and the permeability model, right? 
And then the third level, which will be the, the next phase, which is the volumetric, the uncertainty, and other further QC that is more related uh, with the dynamic part. Right? So I uh, purposely um, structured this into three different levels so we can have a, have a kind of a flow of what we should do first before we jump into the a more um, complicated kind of quality check. So let's start with the, the first one, the level one. We start with general QC. This is very important and sometimes we tend to uh, neglect this, right? So we have to know what's the objective, right? And the project scope of the model itself. Different company might have different objective, different organization might have different project scope. And also the basic thing that we as user tends to forget is the project units and the coordinate reference system, right? So let me start with the objective. So reservoir models can be used for many applications, right? It can be used for visualization, right? As you can see before, um, multiple data from different disciplines can be visualized together, right? Of course, um, can be used for volumetric compared to 2D, 3D model. 3D model can be used for volumetric as well. And of course, for histromatch, for dynamic purpose, right? For well planning, obviously, right? You can um, design a very um, complicated wells. Let's say you have a lateral well and you want to des design it, a 3D model definitely will help you, not only in the preparation, but also in the real-time execution, right? And of course, also for um, enhanced oil recovery or um, maybe water flooding, right? So these are different objectives, uh, different purposes. And we must remember that when the model was built, it was built fit to purpose, right? For instance, when we are studying in the FDP, maybe the purpose of the model is for um, volumetric and, and prediction, right? But we don't have history much yet. But once we have in production data, maybe we built a model that can capture, that we can do history match and maybe for a more detailed kind of um, reservoir management, IOR or EOR, right? So that will, the, that will control how we, con, 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 how will we generate the model, the layering, the resolution, the, in, the data itself, right? So these are the things that need to be considered um, in terms of doing QC, whether that model was built for EOR or that model was built for initial FDP. So that will be different the way the user built the model. So we as a, the one that QCing the model, we have to understand that. Okay, um, the other thing is also the project scope. Whether it's a full field or the model is only comprised of selected reservoirs or fault blocks, right? This is a, a example of the recent field that I've, I've worked before uh, last year. Uh, the model on this field was built into two different, sorry, let me go back. This is again the, so yeah, so this two model uh, was built uh, separately, right? So you can see the shallower model here and the deeper model, which is larger. It was built separately. And there are several reasons normally people doing this. But for this particular field, the reason is because the faults are too complicated to be built in the technology that they're using to be built in one single model. So hence, they have to separate into different models. There might be also other, other reasons why people doing this. Maybe, maybe the cell size it's gonna be too big and the simulation cannot handle it. So that's why they have the model smaller or they focus more on the reservoir that are producing are more important, right? But ideally, of course, a geological model um, ideally is built on a full field scale, right? But again, of course, there are limitation and time is on, time is also another constraint. Um, human resources is also another constraint. That's why we have to understand how the model was built. Is it, is it separated into four blocks because of um, limited of the, the technology or because of the simulation cannot handle? So those are the things that we have to understand. 
The other things that we uh, maybe as, as geoscientists, we take it for granted, especially for bigger companies, right? Since they already have a dedicated team or department to handle this, um, we normally don't really pay attention, but again, this is very important. First thing is the units, right? Whether it's metrics or fields or it's a customized, right? Also the volumetric unit, you have to uh, check whether the reporting is the same as the project. Those are important. And of course, the, the CRS. A larger corporation like ExxonMobil or Petronas, they have a dedicated team to handle this, right? So typically the user don't really have to bother, but for smaller companies, I used to work for a small company where everything we have to handle by ourselves. And once we did mistake in the first place, then it will carry forward all the way to the next stages, right? So we really have to be careful in the project units and also the, the coordinate reference system. And also make sure whether the seismic and the wells are using the same. All right, so that's the general um, QC. We're still at level one here. We wanna see the input data QC. So before we even go to the model, we have to make sure that the input data that we use in order to construct the 3D model is um, the final data that we wanna have, right? And I will divide it into two, two main parts, which is structural related and reservoir property related, right? The structure related, of course, it will affect this maybe the location of your well or the location of your, your 3D models, right? And property related more of, a, of the quality of your reservoir. So let's go one by one. First is the well data. Um, here, whenever you import the, the well data into your project or you QC a well information in, in a project that is already exist, right? With the 3D grid, you have to make sure that um, it's, it's a good practice to check all the wells with the, with the final drilling report. Okay, sorry, this happens again. I'm very sorry for this. Okay, continue. So you have to make sure, it's a good practice that you always check whatever you have the, in the project with your final drilling report or your math logging report because typically those are the final one but once we import it into a digital format there are some mistypo or whatever. So it's always a good practice to check with the, with the final report. Make sure the XYZ information is correct. The KB elevation is something that we normally forget, but it's very critical, especially um, typically wells that are drilled on different vintages, different time. Of course, we'll have different KB because they are uh, taken on a different rig, right? So make sure you have the correct KB elevation and also what data that they're using. Right? That's for um, the trajectory and for the markers. Um, um, normally in a company, in an organization, markers, stratigraphy markers will always be updated. There will always be, always be the, the most recent, most updated marker from the geoscientists or from the stratigraphy department, right? So make sure the model use the latest marker that has been agreed on, right, with the team. Make sure we use that because if, I mean, if you can see here that this particular field have um, hundreds, uh, sorry, thousands of well with I think hundreds of markers. So make you make sure you're using the most updated one, right? Because your markers will be one of the key input for your 3D model building later. And also make sure your horizon or your 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 surface from seismic have markers associated with it, right? Because you want to tie your horizons um, with your well. And it's a good practice to create isopack for each of the zones, for each of the markers, just to see um, any anomalies or whether there is inconsistency in the thickness and you have to make decision whether that makes sense or not, right? It's a good, it's a good practice to do that. So you can have a quick, um, quick understanding of where your sand thickness should be, where the distribution of your sand should be and things like that. So it's a good practice to do that. Right, still in the input data. Next one, we are talking about the fault data, right? Um, if your fault model, if you wanna build your fault model already in depth and you already have a fault 
interpretation from your geophysicist already in depth, then it's always good to, to QC your fault model, the fault model that is part of the 3D model. Okay, again, sorry for this. Uh, let me just. It's a good practice to always, always compare your fault from your 3D model with your original fault from your seismic interpretation. And of course, it has to be on the same domain. Better in a, if it's in depth, it's in depth, right? Both in depth. And check it in 3D and in intersection window to make sure your fault model doesn't really differ that much with the original input. And if it differs, then you have to have an explanation or the geomodel have to have an explanation why it differs that much. And you want to display the fault intersection lines for every different zones, right? It's a good QC. And if you have fault peaks in the well, right? If you, uh, the geologists have fault peaks from the well, either from the core data or from the FMI, the image log or whatever, uh, make sure that fault also tied, the fault from your seismic tied to the well peaks, right? And these are also another two um, good practice to do. If you input our fault polygons, right? Then the fault plane from the model should capture the dip and azimuth. And if the fault are false six interpretation, and then the easiest way is to QC it in a 3D window yeah. or an intersection window, just to make sure the model fault model that you created is consistent with your input data. Okay, the next slide. Now is the seismic horizons, right? Um, our, seism our horizon model, our 3D horizon model comes from an interpretation from the seismic, which is already converted into that. So it's always a good practice to compare the uh, model surface with the original input horizon. So it's always a good practice, right, to display both and QC both, right? The, the input from the seismic and the, the, the modeled horizon. You can create cross sections, of course, along dip and strike, right? It's gonna be make, it's gonna make the QC process much easier. And then also check for any irregular shape or bullseyes or spikes. This is typically arise when the user force the model to match the, the markers. And then you will see some bullseye kind of a phenomena in your 3D. So it's a good practice to, to, to do this QC as well. And then also, see whether there's any, any crossover between the horizons. You, you normally you wouldn't have this and creating a quick isocore from each zones. Um, I think any modeling application can do this very quickly, right? So you just choose the zone and then you select isocore based on the two horizon input, then it will create an isocore. So it, it's a good QC, a good method to see whether there's any crossover or um, undesired thinning or thickness, right? between the horizons. So for instance, uh, this is just a quick snapshot here. Um, I will show you the, my input from my model here. The, the yellow line here is my input from my gridded surface from my seismic. Right? So you can see, of course, typically a gridded seismic is um, continuous here. But my blue line here is my model horizon. So you can see, sorry again. This is by default, that's the problem, so. Okay, let me go back here. So you can see here the yellow, the yellow is my original input from my seismic horizon, which is already converted to that. Typically it's already grid, that's why it's continuous like this. And my red line here is my fault. And of course, um, a 3D model, once it's built, it will have a displacement of the horizon, right? But it's, and you can check whether the displacement and the throw of the fault is, uh, makes sense, right? So I display my blue line here, which is model horizon. It looks pretty decent, right? It stop at the fault and then have a correct displacement to this area here. Maybe in some area, it doesn't really match the, the yellow line here. So these are the area that you have to check, right? But this is again, a good QC to be performed when you uh, QC a model. So always QC it with your 
with the original input data, right? I understand typically if you are a partner or you're the, you the government side, you don't really have all the necessary data, but if it, it will be helpful for you to QC if you have the original input data as well. And of course, if you have a, um, a software that can display something like this together, 3D window, 2D window, and a cross-section window, it, it's, it's, it will be very helpful to perform a QC in a quick way, right? So you can check which area that have some anomalies here, right? It's different from the input data and you can check whether that makes sense or you can even QC it with the original seismic interpretation. So those are the things that uh, I think is critical to be done before we even go to the next process. Okay, so that we are talking about the structural, uh, the structural model, right? Um, still with the input data, now we are talking about the property of the, the model itself, right? So first one is the depositional environment, right? Um, of course, building a geological model, again, I'll let me make sure this one doesn't. Building a geological model, you have to come up with a conceptual model first, right? And this conceptual model, of course, is based on the uh, regional geology from your core data, from your image logs, right? So is the conceptual um, EOD or the positional environment is the one that being used in the model, right? Because sometimes the model tend to simplify it. And then you have to see whether the simplification is um, not differ that much with the original conceptual model, right? And then is there any seismic data that can support the conceptual EOD? That one also you have to um, make sure whether there is or not, right? And then the other thing is how many phases classification from core is taken into the model. Is it oversimplified or is it just enough? Enough here means it captured the main flow unit in the reservoir, right? Because um, core interpretation tend to be very detailed, right? And sometimes we cannot take all the detail into the model because firstly, it's gonna be too complicated. Secondly, it may be not have too much difference in terms of flow unit. So this is where the geologist or the geomodeler have to compromise um, the, the classification from the core and uh, the, the flow unit, right? So these are the thing that um, we, uh, as a person that want to QC the model, need to check whether the EOD has been uh, taken into account uh, properly. Um, the next thing is also the petrophysical, uh, the, sorry, before that, the work correlation, right? So as we know, static graphical interpretation in, a, in an organization always, always been updated. There will always be the, the most recent uh, version, right? So it's good to have the most, use the most updated one and also the one that has been agreed with the, with the team, right? So in order to QC this, you can create several dip section and strike section for the well correlation to just to have a quick understanding. In case you don't have the, the well section panel from the project, you can create your own just basically by creating a very quick, this is, I'm just taking an extreme example from Gawa giant oil field in Saudi. We have 3000 of wells, and then if you have to do well correlation of all of this, it's gonna be quite a, a task, right? But this is just an idea of, it's a good practice to, to also QC from the well section, well correlation before jumping into the 3D model itself, right? And also check whether the reservoir sonation is consistent with the production data, whether it's confirmed with the pressure data, right? Um, it's always a good practice to do that. Um, check also whether there is any thick shale, thick shale layer that might act as a barrier. And then probably this is the reason why the model is split into two. For instance, like uh, in Malaysia here, the upper eye information um, is normally always modeled separately from the, the lower eye because there are thick shale layer in between and there are no communication between the upper formation and the lower formation. So that's one of the justification why they split it into two models. So this is also a good thing to check, right? Because all the input data will be the driving factors of how reliable your model will be. Okay, the next one, 
Okay, the petrophysical interpretation. Again, before I jump here, I let me make sure I don't. Okay. So the petrophysical interpretation is important because you will populate your 3D model using the petrophysical uh, log interpretation, right? So you have to make sure that your model using the final log from the petrophysicist, it's already normalized, uh, different vintage of weld, maybe have different uh, values, right? So you have to normalize that and check whether the necessary um, interpreted logs are available, your porosity, your perm, your v shale, your water saturation, because all of this information will be uh, modeled into the 3D model, right? And also check, whether the uh, rock typing classification from the petrophysicist is consistent with the EOD or the lithophysicist from the sedimentologist. That's also a, a, a important things to do. Um, also check whether that really represent the flow unit, right? Um, because uh, again, at the end of the day, a uh, geological model can be very detailed, but the purpose is still as a feed for simulation. So they will decide, or the reservoir engineer will see, will see the, the rock typing is based on the flow unit, right? So it's important. The other thing, of course, check the perm lock versus the core and the well test data, that's very important. Fluid context, uh, you wanna make sure you use the, the agreed flu context, right? And make sure whether it's observed or estimation, so you know that you have a window of uncertainty, Right in the three D modeling, um, normally fluid context gives the bigger impact in terms of volumetric uncertainty. Right, so fluid context you really have to make sure whether that that one is observed or whether that one is already only applied in in several compartments or it can be applied to the whole field. So those are the things that are very critical in in the modeling later because it affects the volumetric very significantly. Right, so yeah. Even in the input data before we go to the to the modeling, these are all already in, include um, multiple disciplines, multiple domain, geologists, geophysicists, reservoir engineers, and petrophysicists, right? Okay, so those, the one that I just explained are the input data. So let's go to the next stage, which are the, the model itself. Um, these are normally the one that people normally jump into the QC process, so they normally just jump here. But again, it's always a good practice to QC the input data before we go to this process here, right? So in the model QC, I'll just divide it into two different um, um, main categories, the structural model and the property model. Okay, the structural model, um, always check whether the bulk volume is consistent or not that different with the one from the 2D approach from the seismic interpretation, from the uh, gross rock volume from the seismic. If there is any difference why it is, you have to be able to explain, right? And then you can create different geometrical properties. Um, any modeling application can do this. So you can mitigate where is the negative cell volumes, where is the twisted cells, where is the collapse cells. Um, you can do this in a workflow so you can create this very quickly. And then the visualization tool helps this. For instance, this is just an ex easy, uh, simple properties. I just create a dy property, which is basically the distance in y direction. And immediately you can see there is a red color here, meaning that um, the, the distance of the y um, direction in these cells are much larger compared to the rest of the area. So these are the things that um, as, a, as a modeler, you can directly see whether this will give problems or not later in the process, right? So um, any, any modeling application can do this very easily and it's a good practice to always do this. And also uh, one thing to remember is check the statistic of the 3D gate, how many cells it have, right? Does it have millions of cells, cells or hundreds of cells? Because it will impact the simulation later. Then you will have to decide whether you want to upscale the model or not, right? So always good, good uh, practice to check the number of cells. Okay, the next thing is, so that's the, the, the geometry. Now also the zone of interest, right? So as I have already shown from the previous um, example that models sometimes not built as a full field model, right? They are built in compartment or in, in different zone, right? So is this 
zone modeled aligned with the objective, right? Because, um, for instance, I used to work um, in a field where they split the, the east and the west because they have a different uh, drive mechanism, right? And going to the EOR later, it's still okay to use the same model because they're only going to focus the EOR on the east. But let's say they want to focus the UR on both sides, then they have to rebuild the model and combine the model. So that's one of the area that we have to um, also think to, right? And of course, the zone of interest have to be discussed and agreed with the team, also with the government. And also, is there any license boundary or acreage block to be considered, right? Because one structure, for instance, this one is an example from uh, Norway offshore. One structure can actually or possibly consists of two acreage or two different blocks, which is handled by two different operators, right? So for instance, in this case, you can see maybe this one has one structure, but it's operated by two different blocks here as well. So those are the things that um, we, we also need to know um, because it will affect the way how we build the model. And the other thing, this one, we have to QC, uh, check with the reservoir engineers, uh, whether the, the aquifer have enough coverage, right? So the model should have enough coverage of the aquifer because it will detect the drive mechanism, right? So that's very important. And criteria for the field boundary, both at the crestal and the flank areas. These are the things that we need to discuss with the team and we have to basically agree upon. Okay, so that's for the zone of interest. And now for the fault modeling. So we're already taking, uh, talking about fault modeling, compare the model result with the QC, uh, with the input data. We already talked about that, but this is more into the, how we treat the fault model into the model, in the model itself, right? So are all the faults interpreted from the seismic included in the model? Most of the time, it's not. Most of the time, the minor faults will not be included in the 3D model because it will create complication in grid in gridding, right? In terms of gridding, so we need to we need to be aware whether there are faults that are excluded from the model, and also check the fault displacement and toe against the horizon. So uh, this is the scan the same similar with the previous example that I show you. Right? So you can make a cross section and you display two and you can know whether the displacement and the throw is uh, properly captured, right? And check also whether there is a change in the fault style, right? Because once the shape is a little bit irregular, then there will be a change from normal to reverse fault. So you have to make sure whether you want that to happen or you want to prevent that to happen. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to, to always check on that. And you have to also discuss with your reservoir engineers check with the pressure data and the production data, which faults are the one that is sealing, right? Because the fault that are sealing, um, that will dictate how the field is compartmentalized. Uh, it will affect the way you uh, manage your reservoir later. So it's very critical in this point. All right, so after the fault, and then we go with the horizons and the sonations. Um, for the horizons, you have to check the grid resolution, more of the lateral resolution here, right? You want to see whether the X, Y, 100 times 100 is enough, whether it capture enough wells or maybe it's too much, it's going to be, the cells going to be too big, right? Um, check also whether the horizon have any spikes or anomalies. Um, intersection with faults, again, the fault toe must properly be captured. Are all the horizon tied to the main markers, right? And once you have new wells, you have to update the horizons as well. And create isocores, right? And display it in a 2D map, just to make a comparison. Um, also, is there any horizons crossover, right? And again, as a previous example, check, check with the original input horizon. It's always a good, a good thing to do. So I will show you an example um, later after this slide of how the horizons and the layering will really affect how the model will be simulated in the dynamic stage later. So in the layering process here, um, it's a good QC to generate a cross section to see whether the layering actually properly captured the geological relationship, right? Whether it's unconformity or uh, follow top or follow base, right? You really have to make sure 
whether it's geologically makes sense or not, right? And also it's a good uh, practice to display it in a well correlation. So you can compare your block wells with your original locks, right? So then you can see the effect of your layering, whether you lose heterogeneity or you can still keep the, the, the important heterogeneity, right? Histogram is also a good way to do that. And discuss with your RE. This is very important in the in beginning of building the model because this will dictate whether upscaling will be needed or not. So you have to check whether the simulation technology can handle that, whether the hardware can handle that or not. Right. So layering scheme have to minimum, have to capture the minimum bed resolution, but not the thinnest, but in an optimized way. So as long as you capture the main heterogeneity, that should be okay, but you don't want to go very thin as well because then you will have a very big model size, right? So I will show you an example of how um, horizon modeling and layering affect your, your dynamic simulation later. So this example I, take from, I took from one of my colleague here who already presented a corporate webinar from our company, right? So in this example, this is an extreme comparison. So the first picture that I'm showing here is where I have, let's say, limited information. I only know the markers. I have no information in the middle here. So I just put everything proportional, which is the default normally in any other software, right? Default uh, proportional layering. So let's say, because I have no idea what the layering should be, right? And I just use a conformable for every horizons, right? And then I will make another one where I have more information and then I have all the horizons that I need. And also I know how my layering should be, whether it's proportional or follow the top and there is having erosional here, right? Along the bottom. So this information is really needed and it's really crucial because it will dictate how your oil will be uh, how the dynamic of your oil within the reservoir will be during the production time. So I will show you the example of these two different um, extreme um, comparison, right? So the first one, as you can see, actually the, in terms of facies, it's not that different, right? So you have a, have a, <coughs> the, this yellow faces here and the green faces here, quite similar with this one, right? Maybe shape is a little bit different, but again, we captured the main heterogeneity, right? But uh, the main difference from the both, both of the model is that the layering and the horizon uh, scheme. So the difference when it's simulated here is, okay, this one I have to show it on a normal view like this, because otherwise the PowerPoint for some reason cannot display it. So let me play this one. So in the time step, you can see that my sweep efficiency here from here, this injector to this producer, doesn't really go all the way to my production well here on my B1 here, right? So it only stops until here. But if I compare with this one, the model that have a, capture all the necessary information, you can see during the same time lapse, right? You can see my 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 water sweep actually um, reach the bottom part of the model here. So this bottom part here, maybe it doesn't reach up the upper part, but it does reach here. So you can see um, how different it is, the effect of creating uh, horizons with the proper grid and proper layering, right? Other than just making a simple 3D grid like this. Or, or a box, simple box. Okay, let me go back to the slide. Oh, okay, you can see it here. So yeah, so you can see the difference, right? <clears throat> Between the, the model with regular grid and with the different grid. You can see the sweep efficiency in the, the model on the right side is, is connect to the lower part of my well B1. Okay, next slide. Okay, so after you set all the um, structure related, you QC all the structure related, your fault, your horizon, horizon and solation, and then layering style. 
and then it's time to check the property. So for first one is to check the block log or the upscale logs. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Just display a histogram and see if there is any differences between your, your raw log and your upscale, then you have to come up with an explanation, right? So, and also for the continuous properties, is it biased to the faces or not? If it's not biased, why it's not biased? If it's biased, why it's biased? We have to be come up with this answer. And what are the averaging techniques that we're using, especially for permeability, right? Because there are several um, averaging techniques that can be used and any weighting factor that is used during the upscale. So this is an important thing to see um, in the um, QC process of the upscale logs. And then the data analysis. Um, I'm not gonna go very detail into this part, but it's always good to check the virogram that has been used, whether the major minor range are consistent with the depositional environment. And is there any uh, analogy that you can use, right, from a nearby field? Or is there any other measurement that be able to support deep, me deep meter image logs or maybe seismic attributes, right? Um, to, 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 to support my virogram major minor range and my azimuth, right? Um, and if you have more data, of course, uh, you have more constraint on how to develop this uh, virogram. Uh, also good thing to do, perform a cross plot for any data for instance, your porosity perm, right? And compare it with your lithophases or your rock type. And then check whether the perm value uh, from the log is consistent with your core data. And you have to remember core data have very different resolution with your perm log, right? So that also have to be taken uh, into consideration. And if any seismic attribute was used, it's also a good thing to QC the seismic attribute against the, for instance, the porosity, check whether the relation or the correlation coefficient makes sense or not. So that's a good practice to do, right? If, especially if you have a lot of data that you used in building your model. Okay, so the next process is the faces model, right? Um, check the algorithm that was used in the model, whether it's a pixel base or an object base, right? And whether this um, algorithm properly capture the, the conceptual um, um, depositional environment, right? Um, or is there any input Trend, trend map that is used for constraint, right? And after the model was built, also check the dimension, right? Whether it makes sense or not. Uh, maybe a analog from a nearby field or somewhere in the world that um, can be used as an analog uh, is, a, is a good practice to do, right? Check the facies vertical proportion curve, whether there is any changes from the upscale log to the model log, uh, to the model, right? And you also have to remember whether our wells actually cluster in crustal area. Typically, we want to always drill in crustal area. So it might create bias in terms of data collection, right? So we have to understand that whether our um, data points are biased towards certain um, faces or towards certain structure, right? So those are the things that need to be considered and, um, and check when you do a QC. The next one is your porosity model. So you can check your porosity distribution in each faces, um, um, if possible. So each faces should have a, their own porosity range value, right? And also check the virogram lengths for this continuous property, whether it's comparable with your discrete, with your faces, because you will use your faces as a constraint to model your porosity later, right? And is there any 1D, 2D, 3D trend that was there and removed during the process, right? That's also important to know uh, whether there is any transformation that was done during the, the model building, right? And also check whether any secondary variable is used uh, to constrain the porosity. Okay. Um, and the next process, the permeability is quite similar with the porosity and the water saturation model. So I will just jump to the the level three, which is the final QC. Um, so for the final QC, we are going to focus on the volumetric part, right? So it's very important to compare your final 3D model gross rock volume with the initial 2D deterministic values because your 3D model will have multiple realization, right? Uh, will come up with P, P10, P50, P90. So you have to have a strong 
um, deterministic, uh, initial deterministic before you even go to um, stochastic realization. And check during the volumetric whether you're using the correct input, the porosity uh, model, the saturation model, right? And the phases model if you want to constrain it, just to make sure that the volumetric that you produce in the report is the most updated one. And for other properties, uh, BO and BG, of course, discuss that with your reservoir engineers, right? And the volume units, you have to make sure that the reporting and the project that you are using, the software you're using is consistent, right? Um, make sure your, the proper fluid context uh, is used. Um, the one that you are very, have very high confidence. So you will reduce the uncertainty in that contact level because again, contact will give one of the biggest uncertainty in terms of volumetric. For instance, uh, the free water level typically is deeper than your oil water contact. So make sure you're using the oil water contact for the volumetric right, to come up with the base case. All right, and then that's for the input. And for the output, make sure um, you compare the final volumes with other independent measurement from your reservoir engineer, for instance, from MBAL or from your decline curve analysis. It shouldn't be that different, right? And if there is some difference, um, the team should come up with an explanation why there is difference, right? And it's also a good practice to compare the volumes around your production wells um, versus the cumulative hydrocarbon production from the same wells. So it's, it's good practice to do that. And also compare your uh, gross rock volume, um, net pore volume and hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon pore volume to understand the difference and why it's different, right? Because of the, uh, the different parameter or different input that you are using. So there are several more um, QC that you can do, which I'm not going to explain more here because we already reached one hour time limit here. So basically there are more QC that have to be done. The uncertainty analysis, if they already come with a, a several realization and uncertainty analysis. So these are the QC that you have to do. And static dynamic upscaling, if there is an upscaling process, then make sure that you have considered the, the most optimum upscaling and also initialization QC um, in the dynamic. Make sure the volume um, is uh, consistent between the static and the initialization uh, dynamic volume. Okay. Um, the last part for this uh, presentation is, um, since we have been talking a lot of about um, artificial intelligence or automation, right? Can we actually use this in the QC process, right? Um, so for, for my, from my experience, I think automation can really help during the QC process. Maybe not so much for uh, the AI, but as you can see here, um, this is an example from a, of a patrol project, right? So I, we have a plugin here to call all the data from patrol to be exported into T Navigator, right? Um, so that's the software that I'm currently using. So let's say I want to import all the data this is very helpful because if I only export it as a grid, the other input data will not be exported out. But in this plugin, I can use, or I can input all the necessary information that I want to have, and then just press okay, and then I have it all exported, right? So it will be exported as a, as a files, as a flat files to your computer or to your, to your server, for instance, right? And then what you can do is, for instance, in this case, I'm using T-Navigator and I'm using a Python workflow to automate that process. So instead of clicking one by one, I'm importing one by one, well by well, marker by marker, horizon by horizon, I can use Python to automate the process and call all the information in. So it really helps in terms of um, efficiency, right? I don't really have to um, do the import one by one. If I, let's say if I'm working on different application, let's say my, my partner works uh, using uh, Patrol and I'm using T-Navigator. It doesn't stop me in order to do a QC because I can just easily do that. But of course, the QC itself, then the user have to do it manually, right? The export import process can be done automatically, but I would say um, the, the QC itself have to be done manually. But of course, you can also help uh, have automation to help creating the properties, for instance, your negative cells, negative volume, twisted cells and everything, you can create that in the workflow and automate that and it will come up with the result. But again, um, then the user have to manually um, look at it and QC which area 
can be neglected or can be can be uh, have to be updated, right? The same as this one. So, for instance, if you work with a lot of data, and then you can use um, automation. So, in this case, I have one thousand three hundred wells. I can use automation to import all the data just by using a Python uh, script here, right? It's already embedded in the in the software, and it will tremendously help me in terms of efficiency because I don't have to like import it one by one, but the QC is done after I import it inside the software, inside the application. So it really helps in terms of uh, productivity. So you can see all the markers are loaded in. Right. All right, so I think we are right on time, a little bit over, but it's okay. So let me end this presentation with this slide. So again, for a conclusion, as you can see, reservoir model is a very key aspect for the reservoir management process, right? Um, very huge investment or decision is taken based on the precision of your reservoir model, static and dynamic both, right? Because your static and dynamic will predict how your reservoir will behave, and then the investor will basically uh, decide to invest on, on, on the reliability of your model, right? So again, Performing a thorough quality check for a static model is very critical before you even go to the next step because you don't want to have your static model uh, built, not properly capture the main objective. And then once you go to the dynamic and then it's not sufficient enough, then you have to redo your static model, which is, not, uh, which is quite common in the industry where people always have to go back to the static model and rebuild the whole things, right? And then will cost time and productivity. So it's very important to, to have a very reliable static model. Of course, it's not going to be 100% correct, right? Because we have a lot of uncertainty, but at least with a proper process, you can reduce the uncertainty, which at the end will impact your productivity. And of course, the cost for all, overall the project, right? And again, integration of multidiscipline is a key thing, right? You cannot create a geological model without consulting with uh, your team. Uh, your reservoir engineers, your geophysicists, petrophysicists, even drillers, right? Even production technologists um, are all important um, to 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 be considered during this this um, reservoir model study. All right. So with that, I would like to open the question and answer sessions. I think we are right on time. Not bad. Okay, Mr. Ari, thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, we have 20 minutes for Q&A uh, session, but before we start the Q&A session, we have uh, to take a photo session for uh, documentation. Okay. Uh, for all of the audience, can you turn on your camera? Uh, please wait. Uh, please wait. Yeah, the photo session will be taken, so don't be shy. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, for all participants, can you turn on your camera? I see there are only 10 person in here. Okay, I think that's enough.
and I will remind you that to that you to fill uh, the feedback form the through the link that we have sent in the chat box, and if you uh, would like to request uh, the certificate, you can fill it in the feedback form too. Let me see. Uh, for all the participants, if you have question, you can type it down in the chat box, and or you can uh, raise your hand, and we will unmute your microphone. Can I ask question? Yes, uh, Pak Mr. Sigitari. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Um, um, what is the most um, parameters that in maybe level two QC will affect on the volumetrics? Is it uh, Structural or the um, petrophysics um, QC, I mean petrophysics uh, matters. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, Pasigit. So, yeah, um, in, er, in terms to see which one affects the most uh, in terms of volumetric, there is very important to do um, uncertainty analysis, right? But again, the of course, if the horizons have high uncertainty, then it will want to have one of the biggest impact to the volumetric. The other thing that I also mentioned just now is the contact. Once the contacts you have un big uncertainty, then the, the volumetrics will be high. But one thing that we need to understand here, it's not only the volumetrics uncertainty that have bigger impact in terms of dynamics. Sometimes even though like, let's say the, the variogram, right? Maybe the variogram of the facies, um, you don't have any clear understanding, right? So how much should be the variogram? Um, and then you decided, okay, then the variogram should be this much. And then when you play with that in the uncertainty parameter, it doesn't give a big impact in the volumetric. So you kind of like, okay, then that's okay, right? But you also have to see whether the dynamic is, will be impacted, right? Same volume of different 3D model realization might give different mod, might give different volume, but in terms of dynamic, it might different, it might behave very differently, right? So you, as you can see just now, um, the, the 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 example that I used two videos, right? The the faces is similar, um, the 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 channel is there and everything, but the way we set the layering, it affect the connectivity of the sand. So maybe in terms of volume, it wouldn't be different, but in terms of dynamic, the sweep efficiency will be very different. So that's one of the key consider key thing to consider. That's why it's always good to have uncertainty analysis in your 3D model. So you know which parameter affect the most and not only in the volumetric, but also in the dynamic. Hence why it's critical to always integrate um, geomodeler and uh, reservoir engineers. I hope that answer your question, Pasigit. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Ms. Rari, there is uh, okay. one question. That's a good question, yeah, I can see. Um, is there any shortcut to do the QC if there are many wells? Okay, so I wouldn't really say a shortcut, right? But um, one of the recommended ways is, again, to create an isopack map, not only from the markers, not only from the horizons, but also from the markers. So then you can compare uh, your marker isopack with your model isopack, whether it have a very different approach, and then you can see whether the model actually use isopack information in controlling the thickness. So it's not really a shortcut, but it's a, it's a best practice to do, right? And it, it, I mean, if you have a lot of wells, then still the same, you, you create uh, the isopack for all the wells. That's gonna be the same with uh, 
less so wells, right? And the, the, the way you visualize the map is just going to be the same, less so well with many wells. Yeah. Is the Python codes for automation are available? Um, yes, um, this one, um, I mean, this is, I'm talking specifically with, with T-Navigator, the, the uh, T-Navigator and Petrel plugin. If you have Petrel, then you uh, import, sorry, you have the plugin, then you can just export it out. And then when you import it in, the, the Python code is already available to have all that information um, directly imported all the way into T-Navigator. That's just an example. I think other software have the same capability as well, right? Because now, um, all of the software in the industry try to have some automation capability embedded into their into their application. So yeah, it is available. But again, it's more for automation. It's not really for artificial intelligence for QC. Is there any question? This is from uh, Mr. Yasinto Priyastomo. I want to ask about volumetric QC. If you if you are in the client side with limited data, whether the volume is make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, to 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 decide whether the volume makes sense or not. Um, it really depends on the data, right? The more you have data, the more confidence you have with the with with your volume. And the lesser you have, of course, the higher uncertainty you will get. So again, I would say if you have limited data, right, then you you will have to you will have to explain and understand that your volume might be um, way different than what it actually is. But you, of course, you can come up with the best best decision based on the existing data and come up with the best volume that you can get but of course if you have let's let's say let's say you only have 2d lines right of course 2d lines won't give you the best volume or the most uh, confident volume compared if you have 3d data right and of course time depth conversion also plays another factor if you don't have a proper time depth conversion then what you have from your from your structure from your time converting to depth then there may be some some uncertainty in there as well but for me, as long as you understand the uncertainty that you have, then you will be able to explain um, what are the parameters that is controlling your volumetry. Yeah. This is the next question uh, from Mr. Zebut Spikal. What is the best applicable difference between the dynamic and volumetric? Estimated reserve generally 5%, but we can improve. Okay, uh, yeah, very good question, uh, Mr. Zeboidis. So this depends on a different company, different organization. So typically it lies between 5% to 7%, right? Static and dynamic. Um, the, the, the difference in volume because the way reservoir engineer initialize the dynamic model is different than geologists um, cal cal calculate the volume in static. But in a way it should be less than 5%, three to 5% should be acceptable, right? I think the best method to do this if your geoscientists and reservoir engineers are working in the same team and using the same application or integrated application, I would say, right? So there will be less in terms of export import. So you will have less error, I would say. But again, there will always be difference. And I think 3%, 5% is acceptable. And again, compared to the organization and also com, um, depends on what stages you are in, in, in the 3D modeling, right? If you are in the UR stage, maybe um, less than 5%, is uh, desired maybe even less than three percent right but if you are in the early fdp stage maybe even seven percent is acceptable yeah it really depends on the companies patronas when i wrote the la that last time it's slightly different with exxon where i was seconded so um it's a matter of discussion between the two organizations if you are having different uh, standard but as long as you can explain that um and it should be uh, should be okay
There is no more question. Okay. It's okay if there is no more question or if the question will be later, um, you can always contact me here um, in my um, private email, rkrishna.gmail.com or in my company's email, i.krishna at rfdyn. Or we can, we can connect in LinkedIn. I'm always open for any connection. So we can have a further discussion if you are interested in. So yeah, uh, thank you again very much uh, for attending this webinar. Thank you very much for SPT, uh, SP Balikpapan. Hello, I'm sorry. There is yes. one more question. Sure, sure. Uh, how to do a QC when you integrate machine learning in your model? Uh, does the uncertainty analysis help being model with uh, machine learning? Okay, so again, I don't have experience yet in performing machine learning uh, to do QC. I mean, I can do automation, right? Automation is just a simple process, so I don't have to do it one by one. But in terms of machine learning, I'm afraid I don't have the answer because I don't have experience using machine learning for performing QC. At the moment, I think all the QC have to be done manually because it needs a very thorough um, um, investigation. But I can imagine in the near future, um, AI can help to detect, um, for instance, which which map or which zones have anomalies, right, compared to the others based on putting certain parameters, right? I think that that is a machine learning that I think can be applied for QC. For instance, I want to create maps, isocor maps, and then highlight me the maps that's showing thickness below 0 0.5 meters. And then the machine learning will be able to pick up. So those are the things that I, would, I can see it will happen, but I just ha don't have the experience yet. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sari. Uh, for all the participants, uh, you can you can fill the feedback form uh, through the link that we have sent in the chat box. Your your uh, input will be useful for our next uh, webinar. Uh, I think uh, that's and that's end of our uh, webinar today. Uh, uh, thank you for Mr. Ari. Thank you so much for your willingness to for being our speaker today. Uh, My to pleasure. My pleasure. For all participants too that have joined today's uh, webinar. See you in our uh, next webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate. Yes, Ali. Ini udah berat ya, Mas Christian? Iya, Pak. Udah berat ya? Udah, Pak. Okay. Terima kasih banyak yang lagi. Iya, sama-sama. Makasih banyak udah diundang ya. Semoga bisa ketemu di lain waktu. Iya, iya. Silakan. Amin. Terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak, Pak. Ya.